afternoon, and welcome to Pushing Limits, KPFA's weekly program by and about people with disabilities. I am Mark Ramoser, voicing for Jacob Lesnar Buxton, who is the lead producer on today's program. I don't know why you have problems getting along. You seem so alike. Chances are most people have heard that statement from a family member or friend. They are dumbfounded at how two people with similar needs and passions can't come together and form an amazing connection. Today we will be talking about two groups of people who, despite having similar experiences, have had trouble all coming together. From the outside, it looks like seniors and those with disabilities would be the perfect partners in creating a more just society. Both groups face challenges like inaccessible housing, lack of public transportation, and the high cost of care. Although centers and other seniors and disability networks are forming, issues such as ableism and ageism prevent alliances between seniors and those with disabilities, keeping them strangers. Today we will talk to three people who are working to build powerful alliances between people with disabilities and seniors. Our first guest is Ashton Applewhite, who is an anti-ageism activist from New York. Applewhite is author of This Chair Rocks, a Manifesto Against Ageism and the blog, Yo, Is This Ageist? My name is Ashton Applewhite. I am an author and an anti-ageism advocate, a pro-aging advocate, uh, very interested in the way ageism and ableism. Well, I started because uh, I, I, I looked in the mirror or looked around me and it occurred to me that this getting old thing was happening to me. I think it's hard to imagine getting older, especially when we're young. Um, we pretend really hard that it's not going to happen, but I'm kind of a bull by the horns type of person. And I realized like, yeah, it's happening to me just like every other human in the world. And so I started learning about longevity. That was about 15 years ago. I'm 70 now. For those who are unfamiliar with the term, ableism is discrimination and social prejudice against people with disabilities or people who are perceived to be disabled. We asked Ashton but when she realized a connection between ageism and ableism. You know, the dictionary definition of ageism is discrimination and stereotyping on the basis of age. We are being ageist any time we make an assumption about someone uh, on the basis of how old we think they are. And of course, it's more than that dictionary definition. It's a whole system of beliefs and social behaviors that are encoded in us and in the environment. Systems such as capitalism, as well as the media and ignorance about the issues, contribute to challenges in forming strong alliances between seniors and those with disabilities. I think, although I knew what ableism was and refer to it in my book, when I became much more aware of it was in the early days of the pandemic because of the early messaging around the virus, which was, don't worry, it's just going to kill old people and sick people. And I think it's inaccurate to say, and please correct me if I get things wrong, that sick in this context is a substitute for disabled. So it woke me as an activist to the need to address, to understand more about ableism personally, and to address the way the dual stigma hurts, uh, well, frankly, everyone, because everyone is aging and everyone either is born with some sort of disability or ages into some degree of it. And so I became aware that we really needed to learn more and speak out against both these forms of discrimination. The end and in your experience, do you see any? This is KPFA's Pushing Limits, and today we're talking to anti-ageism advocate Ashton Applewhite who is talking about some of the challenges and successes she sees in establishing solidarity between the senior and disability communities. Enormous ableism in every corner of what I refer to as age land. First, most people don't even think about getting older and even think of themselves as anti-aging. And of course, aging is living. 
you can no more be anti-aging than anti-living, anti-breathing. So in under capitalism, the way to age well or age successfully, which is a phrase I heartily dislike because why should we, have, you know, you don't fail. Yeah. <laughs> you don't fail at childhood. You don't, you know, if, you, yeah. if you're, aging, you're aging successfully. But this idea is that we are aging, quote unquote, successfully by continuing to look and move like younger versions of ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Think about those annoying, you know, advertisements of older people, you know, waltzing or walking on the beach. You never see disability of any sort, even in capacity of, you know, you know, reduced capacity of any sort. So that whole vision is profoundly ableist and also classist because it costs money to get to a beach to stroll on and to have leisure and to have a healthy diet and all those things that enable people to age well under this very biased scenario, which really means to not age at all. So even, and even people who are aware sort of take the baby steps. And this was true of me also that, oh, gee, everything awful I've heard about getting older, how everything's going to, you know, stop working and you're going to be lonely and life is going to be awful. As for ageism within the disability community, I have only just realized that I need to identify as disabled. I have severe hearing loss in one ear, and I'm happy to talk about that. But it's not a community I know as well as I know my progressive corner of age land, although, you know, I'm, I'm starting to know more and more people in it, which is wonderful. I think the main sign of prejudice against older people is the omission of ageism entirely. There is so much fantastic disability justice activism, which is also about indigenous rights, about climate rights, about LGBTQ rights. And I don't see ageism as part of that list where it belongs. So I don't think that's so much conscious. And I want to make one qualifier, which is that ageism is any judgment on the basis of age and it also affects younger people. Older people bear the brunt of it. I think most of the disability justice community is younger people. And for whatever reason, it seems to me that ageism has yet to bleep onto their radar. Most bias is unconscious. I think that is unconscious, but that is what I observe. Yeah. Thank you for that. Being able to identify as a disability is key to ending stigma. Applewhite talks about how to encourage others to embrace their disability. I am very, very excited that just in the last few months, and I will count getting an email from you as one of these exciting indicators, that people are starting to realize, recognize the need to address ageism and ableism together. Ignore the overlap. Two things happen. We don't we don't work towards solidarity, which is why I'm so delighted to be talking about this with you and your audience. Let's just raise that possibility and start to see the million forms it might take. And also, we reinforce dual stigma. One of the harder icky things, icky is not a very scientific word, but I know that, that young people who use canes or walkers are told, you're too young for that. Well, I, I call that age cooties. That's icky. And if you have internalized ageism, which we all do, no judgment, that might make your situation or the way in which you are visible in that way even harder to cope with and to come to terms with. So I know it harms people with disabilities, and I surely know it harms older people because uh, it's not healthy to go through life dreading our futures and feeling stigma around the need, which awaits us all for, at a minimum, helping hands and probably hearing aids. I wear hearing aids, probably a cane, possibly a walker, very likely a wheelchair down the line. So as long as we act as though old people aren't going to become disabled if we like eat enough kale or are successful yeah. enough, and younger people don't address the way the fact that we are all aging and that there is dual stigma that we can come together and do something about 
we are harming each other because you hear, well, I may be old, but at least I'm not disabled. You know, I may be disabled, but at least I'm not old. All that does is dig the respective holes deeper and it does harm us, I believe, severely. The most honest and probably the most effective thing I can do is to lead with my own example. In the talk that you heard me give, I talk about losing most of the hearing in my left ear. How long ago? Six or seven years ago to an acoustic neuroma. And I caught myself thinking, well, at least it's sexy brain tumor deafness instead of a sad old person deafness as an example of both ageism and ableism in me, you know, after all the thinking I've done. It was not until just three weeks ago that I met someone who is doing with two colleagues of mine a workshop that I'd love to talk about on the intersection of ageism and ableism. And she identifies as disabled. And I said, "Ah, well, I don't identify as disabled. And she said, why not? You're listening to Pushing Limits, where today we are talking about alliances between the disability community and the senior community. Our next guest is Julie Reiskin, co-executive director of Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. Julie offers some insights about the history between seniors and those with disabilities combined with differences in perspective, create challenges when building alliances. To be honest, it's it's over the years, not as much as we should. It's been somewhat of a struggle. Although right now we have a great relationship with a group called the Colorado Center on Aging. They used to be called the Colorado Senior Lobby, but they're now the Colorado Center on Aging. And to be honest, the reason we have such a good relationship is that some people from our community got involved with them and started really talking about the intersection of disability and aging. People with disabilities for the first time ever are aging. We've never really done that a lot before now. Most of us didn't live long enough to age, but we are now um, starting to age. There are more of us living into their 60s, 70s, even 80s. There are also a lot of issues that even younger disabled and older have in common. And I think we used to be lumped together so much, we all kind of resisted that for so long. Yet there have been some successes increasing change that benefits both groups. Reiskin highlights two of those victories, which she says helped strengthen the bonds between both groups. For reference, Medicaid is a federal health care program for low-income people, known in California as Medi-Cal. We had a Medicaid buy-in program for working adults with disabilities, but it stopped at 65. So like you couldn't use it after age of 65. So we ran a bill to add people, to allow people to get it over 65. And I think the senior community is now realizing it just got implemented this year that they're realizing, oh, you know, th- this can really help us because this way someone who needs Medicaid, not Medicare, because they have long-term care needs, long-term services and supports needs can get the services now in Colorado by buying it into Medicaid if they have a job and they have a disability. When I, and when I say long-term care, it's mostly community-based services here, home and community-based services. We're very involved in a, a very big redesign of the long-term care program, both the assessment tool as well as the case management system. And so we're, we're very mindful as we're doing our advocacy and our outreach and our education and, and our, you know, particularly our advocacy to make sure that the needs of seniors are being included because because people with disabilities are lifelong Medicaid clients, we are the ones that tend to be at the policymaking table, whereas there aren't a lot of seniors at those tables. And we're certainly trying to recruit seniors, but often because we have the, the long-term experience using these systems, we're the client voice. So trying to be a lot more intentional about making sure that that senior perspective is included in some way. Julie also says that there is more division between people who create policies and manage services that affect seniors and people with disabilities than those who are part of those two communities. I think the ableism and ageism getting in the way of our ability to advocate for policies has been more at the systems level with government or providers where they see us all. I think they lump both our elders and people with disabilities as when they're like, well, you know, we have to protect you, you're not competent. That kind of protectionist attitude that has infected our community, I think that also applies to seniors. 
So I think that that's where I found, and I, and I feel like ageism and ableism are very connected where people think that we're frail or that we're not competent or that because we might do something more slowly that we're, it, we somehow are not as good. So I think that they're very, very interrelated. And then of course, when you add like racism on there um, yeah. or homophobia, then it, you know, it just adds to all of that. Um, yeah like all intersectional issues. So, but I, I see that those are more of a barrier with human services providers and government folks or like rule makers than it is within the disabled or the aging communities in terms of true barriers. I think with the disabled and aging communities, we need to understand each other better. But I think generally those of us involved in advocacy are willing to do so, are willing to do that work. Now, uh, of course, those of us involved with advocacy is not the whole population. Julie talks about race in the context of forming alliances between disability and senior communities. Absolutely, yeah. I think um, I think that um, groups that are led by you know Black, Indigenous, people of color are much more aware of and open to include disability and get our issues more. Most cultures are more respectful of their elders, and again, there's certainly like white cultures that are respectful of elders, but I think. Yeah. You know, particularly like if you look at like indigenous cultures, like they're very respectful of their elders. So they're definitely more open to collaborating. But I also think that people in the social justice space are starting to see age related issues and disability issues as a social justice issue, which, you know, our community has been fighting for forever to say this isn't about social services, it's about civil rights. And I think that's finally being seen more broadly, which is fantastic. But I, I do think there's definitely an like a, a over, you know, racial issues, certainly and racism permeates all parts of our society. And I think that when you're dealing with adding age and disability on top, people just experience that much more discrimination. I do think that the other place where racism comes in is that people, particularly Black and Native American people, are not don't live as long. And so they have fewer elders. And the reason they don't live as long is, is absolutely systemic racism, mostly in our healthcare system, but also toxic stress and all of that. Lastly, I asked Julie about what are some issues that could be addressed if we had powerful age and disability coalitions? I think we're going to have to increase our coalition building and work better to get, like work more together, just as resources, you know, are scarce. I think the issue of social security is an ongoing issue. You know, something we share, I think housing for people on fixed incomes is an issue we share. You know, the case management system with Medicaid, you know, long-term services and supports are issues we share. So I think we've got to do better and we've got to, you know, the seniors have done a good job of positioning themselves as a voting block and the disabled community needs to do the same thing because we do, we have enough of us where we could swing elections we need to vote as a block. And if disabled and seniors together would start focusing on issues, you know, the seniors have done a great job with social security and Medicare, but now we need to look at Medicaid and long-term services and supports and make them as much of a sacred cow as social security yeah. is. And also get social security, you know, the benefits for retirees are better than for disabled. You don't get punished for working as much yeah. and you get treated better. And so we need to be able to get some of those perks on the disability side so more disabled people can go to work and not have to be so fearful of losing needed support. You know, there are a lot of people that maybe can't work 40 hours a week or can't do a traditional job, but I always say if you're not in a coma, you can do something. And so, but a lot of people with disabilities get discouraged from work because they're afraid that they're going to then lose the benefit that they do need to survive because they might not be capable of full self-support. So we need, so, social security needs to be completely changed because right now the definition of social security is the inability to engage in any substantial gainful activity and substantial gainful activity is earning like, you know, half of what rent costs in Denver for a studio. So those systems just need to change. And I think if we banded together, we could get better changes for both groups better for seniors and better for people with disabilities, especially as the retirement age continues to go up. And then also to make Medicare better, you know, so that people don't have to go on Medicaid or not as many people. 
and make the long-term care system a lot, lot better. I think that we have the votes and the political power. We just need to organize ourselves. My dream is that we do that and we do it with a racial equity lens and also a lens of uh, making sure that people with disabilities and seniors aren't forced to live in poverty because they need certain supports. Our final guest is Kathleen Real. She is an advocate with many years of experience working to forge alliances between those with disabilities and seniors. As a member of both communities, we were curious about her perspective in trying to forge alliances between both groups. In the following clip, she references the medical model. That idea suggests that a person's disability shapes how they experience the world. While some hold this belief, others subscribe to the social model, which suggests that the lives of people with disabilities are primarily impacted by social attitudes. Hi, well, I'm, I'm Kathleen Real, and I am a senior and a person with a disability. And I was a long-term employee of a disability rights organization prior to my retirement. So I'm here to talk about working with the disability community, working with the aging and adult care community. And um, for several years, um, my disability rights organization served on committees with seniors. I, for one, served on the public authority uh, for several years for our county in Santa Barbara, and along with other persons with uh, representing various sides of necessity of in-home care, including the main senior organization representative was always at these meetings, although we never actually had any seniors or consumers of that service there. It had always been such that the main representative of the senior organization always had to be the spokesperson and in care of the senior community. They had very different views sometimes from what the disability rights community wanted out of in-home supportive services. And sometimes we would, could um, agree and sometimes we did not. Uh, as they definitely felt that it was a more medical model for them and did not see the connection at all between seniors with disabilities and the disability community. I also served for several years on the Adult and Aging Network this was a group of probably 30 different organizations in our county, all of them serving seniors except for my disability rights organization. I was the only representative of a, of a disability organization, even though it was called the Adult and Aging Network, us being the representatives for adults with disabilities. So even through this, there was really not a lot of cohesion with the whole working together on the aging community and the disability community. There is a lot of still push in the medical model. Even though we had so much in common, we had tried for probably about 15 years to work with the representative of the leading senior organization in our community on an adult and aging network, but we could never quite get anybody to recognize the interests that we both had together, such as in-home care, long-term care, durable medical, uh, health care, uh, housing. I mean, we all had needs for an accessible environment the senior, they really fought hard, I think, against the senior community viewing their needs, even though many of them had uh, hearing and visual and mobility challenges, to see them as working with the disability organizations in town. So uh, I think there may be a little more work towards that that's occurring now very slowly. I'm retired now and, and volunteer still with the Disability Rights Organization. And I am still very much interested in building unity between the aging and disability communities. 
So Kathleen, what is the damage that comes from both groups not working together? Perhaps access to the Aging and Disability Resource Center or ADRC that the government has set up? I think it's a great loss to the community. There's an ADRC in so many counties around us that are working well. And the whole no wrong door approach to being able to connect people with needs for services with those around us in the community, having that knowledge centralized has been wonderful for a lot of people. And I think that we really missed all those years. It's been working great in other places, not having it here. But seriously, now retired and a senior myself, I live in a senior community where I noticed that the seniors before my generation, the, the ones that I guess you would call the traditional generation before the boomer, so to speak, when I dis even discuss disability in the dining room on access issues I've encountered, I'm feeling the people in the who are like 80-ish and over are not seeing the connection either with the seniors and disabilities and how we all need a lot of the same kinds of services. It's really interesting to see that we're missing the mark on getting the information out there to the senior community. But I think there are those organizations that still hold that very medical model, must protect seniors, not letting them have you know, the wrong information as if we would give wrong information, right? But I'm still not seeing as just a person about town in the community seeing people having that connection in the, here at all. Lastly, do you have suggestions on how to improve unity between seniors and those with disabilities? You know, this community used to hold a, a senior event at Earl Warren every year where a lot of organizations had booths and provided services and we would get our flu shots. And it was a huge thing that was provided through the main senior organization with funding from Area Agency on Aging. And I did not see us participate in that as much as we could have. I think if we were more present in the senior community activities with some of our assistive technology and in-home care information and things that we really have a lot in common with, you know, we would have more community presence and more of the aging community would see us as a part of the whole. Thanks to our guests today for willing to be candid in talking about challenges in building alliances to advocate for social justice. Also to Jacob Lesnar Buxton for conducting the interviews, as well as to our editors, Mark Ramoser, Adrian Lobby, and Sheila Gunn Cushman, and also to the engineer on duty today. We will be back next week at this time. Our topic will be the new Disability Justice Center on the campus of Cal State University East Bay. The center is, as far as I know, the first of its kind in the Bay Area and one of the first in the country. This is an exciting development. They just had their launch party a couple of weeks ago up at their campus in the Hayward Hills, so be sure to join us for that. Thanks for listening, everybody, and don't forget to keep on pushing. Sign up to volunteer for the 51st annual KPFA Holiday Benefit Craft Fair happening December 3rd and 4th. It's a great way to show your support for KPFA and volunteers have free entry to the fair for the entire weekend. We rely on our wonderful team of volunteers to help keep the event running smoothly. Each volunteer shift is two and a half to three hours long with jobs including taking tickets, helping exhibitors unload their wares, and other light duties around the fair. If you're interested, please visit the CranewayCraftFair.com website at www.CranewayCraftFair.com. At the volunteer sign-up page, choose the shift that best fits your schedule. Again, that's CranewayCraftFair.com. Hope to see you there.
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.